So I'm going to explain a little bit about this AI in finance. And before we start, I mean, let me just uh, delve into explaining to everyone and to remind myself also that somehow this AI that we all talk about so much is a young science. It's like um, a Why not? Something... Sorry, can you make it full screen? Uh, okay, let's try. Now is it full screen? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Good. Okay. Um, so that it's a, in fact, a, uh, uh, let's just go through this one. Uh, okay. So, uh, so that it's like I started like early in the mid, uh, in the, in the 20th century, but in some sense, there is this moment in 56 in which we had this Dartmouth college, this Dartmouth school in the summer, the summer of the Dartmouth summer for AI, in which the reason why I want to emphasize this is that the proposal was written and that summer, which was supposed to be two months, 10 people, was uh, had as a goal to proceed on, to a study that would proceed on the basis that every aspect of learning and any feature of intelligence could be in principle so well described that the machine could do it. So in some sense, it was his belief that uh, you could do AI in two months <laughs> with 10 people. And that's really was what happened in uh, 56. And this uh, Dartmouth summer did take place. And the 10, sorry, the 10 people involved were um, uh, several people, including Herb Simon and Ellen Newell, who I knew very well at Carnegie Mellon. So it was also the first time that the term artificial intelligence was used and it was introduced by John McCarthy. But it was a very interesting concept that they believe that all aspects of intelligence, any feature of intelligence could be in principle so well described. So, and because of this kind of like um, such universal goal of uh, AI trying to capture all intelligence, the field proceeded from a research point of view as a field of uh, a science and engineering of components. You understand? So we have like people that delve into the data processing, the natural language processing, the vision processing, the speech, all sorts of like the input to the reasoner part. And there are researchers that and in our field that, and, uh, that uh, work on these specific aspects of data. But then there is like people that work on the decision making, the cognition, the cognitive part of intelligence in terms of like um, algorithm for searching, planning, learning, all sorts of optimization, knowledge representation, in uh, learning, uh, multi agent reasoning. So we have like all sorts of aspects of cognition, of thinking uh, that would uh, take as an input eventually the data that was processed uh, by our data processing algorithms and then eventually this gets executed into all sorts of like interaction with humans all sorts of oops oops uh, all sorts of like uh, interaction with humans all sorts of like uh, being able to uh, uh, continuously learn from feedback so uh, so this is what ai in some sense is about and the reason why i think it's important for us to uh, to think about this and to share this uh, view of AI with all of you is because AI is not indeed just or is not indeed only machine learning. Uh, we love our data, but, uh, you know, the natural language processing, all sorts of like not representation, all sorts of like uh, multi-agent reasoning, they're all like issues related to the actual complete AI picture. So there are, there are, there is an interest on trying to put all these things together and while some go in depth in the individual aspects of AI. So I'll be happy to answer questions I'll, uh, as we go, but this was the, my first message was in fact this concept of having like this uh, uh, field of components. Then before I delve into several projects, I'm going to just uh, spend one minute here explaining these aspect of doing research in a financial industry. So as you can imagine, the finance world is uh, broad and uh, very kind of like um, um, uh, facing a lot of challenging problems. And having an AI research group at JP Morgan, this large institution of uh, financial character was something that led us to define these aspirational goals for AI research. And we have three categories of goals, three mainly uh, to address 
issues related to the finance domain itself, uh, like AI to like core domain, like AI to predict and affect economic systems, uh, AI to liberate data safely because so much data is created, and AI to eradicate financial crime. Then three, go three aspirational goals with respect to stakeholders, like how to empower employees, uh, how to perfect client experience and how to agentize policy compliance in the sense that we have these regulators. So we have these stakeholders, the regulators, the clients, and the, empower, the employees, and we want to uh, address these three fronts. And then finally, we have this uh, issue that uh, the, our AI systems have to embrace these values, establishing ethical and socially good AI with um, concerns about fairness and trust and all sorts of like explainability. So, Think about now these AI research in the finance domain organized along these multiple kind of like uh, uh, lines of, 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 of reasoning. Okay, so I am going to just explain a few projects. So I'm going to talk about four projects and then I'll close good. Uh, so, um, and uh, these four projects, the first one I want to share with you is these um, uh, based on image for decision making and let me just explain to you and uh, uh, the problem of actually that uh, these trading floors so you probably have seen in movies as I had seen uh, trading floors where people are behind uh, many screens uh, where uh, the the assets uh, the, the, these stocks these these specific like kind products are basically um, displayed as a time series data, how their pricing is changing over time. But the interesting thing is that um, you, the, these, these traders uh, who make decisions about buy and sell surround themselves by these, by these visual information. And as I was looking at this, I thought, oh my God, this is all about the humans, these traders using images to guide decisions. So they basically see uh, the time series moving in some direction and they know when to buy and when to not buy. So because we had been so successful in uh, AI with uh, object classification using deep learning, I thought that instead of you, so we were using images of objects, mainly people, cars, tables, uh, bicycles, chairs, all sorts of like, uh, objects and we are able to classify as we know now thousands of like such objects i thought that it would be interesting to really use the time series data as images themselves and uh, use uh, we use like the time series data and automatically chop part of the time series data and converted this into uh, the images as we could see on the trading floor these people look at their screens with all these images and so basically we trained the neural net and we are able to, this system called Mondrian, and we are able to actually learn not the concept cat and dog, not the concept uh, chair and table, but the concept buy, no buy, associated with uh, uh, specific uh, shapes of these uh, time series data represented as images. So uh, we were able to, these Mondrian were able to perform very well on historical S&P 500 data with high accuracy and uh, high precision on that these decisions that people had made by no buy. Uh, so after that, uh, and then I'll pause in a second, we actually started thinking, so if we can do this Mondrian C, which is this Mondrian classification, uh, uh, could we do a prediction? And so uh, we first did the classification by no buy, and then we do two other types of prediction, one which is just a time series prediction, what is going to be the future. And basically we use as an input part of an image and we gave the output, the, the rest of the image, 80% of the, the time series was given as the input and 20% was given as the output, which was a completion uh, of that input. And we trained uh, an autoencoder to be able to generate this output. And also we did some uh, based on image on video that I'm not going to explain now, but basically trying to predict the completion of a sequence of, of, Im of, 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 of different, um, uh, different dynamics of the time series. 
So uh, basically the, the results when we did these um, prediction were really uh, very interesting. Here I show what uh, basically the signal looked up to 80 time steps. And in red, the prediction for the last 20 steps uh, done by this Mondrian prediction system that uses these uh, images to complete an image. And uh, in black, in the last 20 uh, steps, you see the real data uh, as it came. So as you see, the, the, the red, the red uh, prediction is very accurate compared to the, the, the ground truth. And in a paper that you will have an opportunity to see at a point or two at the end of the, the presentation, uh, we actually uh, go over all the metrics we've used to calculate how precise these predictions were. But the beautiful thing here for us to understand from this first kind of like project that, I sh that I'm showing you is the fact that um, we are using images for uh, the representation of information that's not necessarily objects. In this particular case, we have uh, time series. Other examples we have done uh, represented other things, including pie charts uh, or even like screens uh, to try to uh, classify what the, the screen is about. And again, it's not objects, but we had classification of screens uh, saying you are looking at email, you are looking at a specific kind of like uh, websites or just an Excel page or so you could, you, we can classify images of, uh, of other things than objects and uh, very successfully both uh, classify and predict what's the next image. We only need predictions for time series, not really for uh, websites or uh, email. And uh, I will pause here for, I'm going to go through the next uh, contribution, but I would like to now pause and take any questions in case people have questions uh, or uh, comments. Uh, now pause for comments or questions just for a minute on this first kind of project. First, uh, so, so far we talked about AI in general, and then eventually we went through this first project uh, as an example of applying, uh, of bringing AI, very innovative AI to the financial domain. Any questions, Irina or company or everybody else has questions? So we are taking questions in the Slack channel. Um, please join the channel and post the questions there. But I think it's better to save the questions for the end of the talk. Okay. So maybe you can go through and we'll okay. ask the questions at the end. Okay, thanks a lot, Irina. So, so basically then uh, we are here on this particular kind of like uh, outline and this journey for the talk. And uh, you, we told you, I told you about AI, I told you about the actual uh, seven aspirational goals. And this image for decision-making that I mentioned to you is within the goal of trying to predict very complex uh, um, uh, economic systems. So this trading is a very complex, oper complex operation that involves a lot, a lot, a lot of like, uh, assets and basically uh, they are changed over time. And by using this type of modern system, we, we are able to predict uh, uh, better what's going to be the future of these different assets the represented as time series. Um, uh, the next uh, example I'm going to focus on is something very dear to my heart, which is this multi-agent learning. So let me just delve into this with you again again, within the, the research goal of trying to uh, um, um, predict and affect large economic systems. So think about the problem of a market. A market, in particular, over the counter matter, it's because it doesn't matter. A market is basically a, um, a multi-agent system uh, in which there are two types of agents. There are the market makers and there are the investors. And the market makers basically only uh, they stream uh, prices, they, they offer prices at which they are willing to trade an asset. So someone needs to uh, sell, I don't know, these many shares of Apple or this, uh, or make a, um, an ex uh, currency exchange. So they want, they offer, so the vet kind of like, you, you, you look at what the market makers are streaming prices at 
different assets. And so they are only um, offering this information to, uh, to trade uh, these uh, stream the prices at which they want to trade an asset. As opposed, the investors, which is other type of agents, they decide basically which market maker, which market maker are they going to transact with? So based in principle on the pricing, but uh, uh, so it's uh, there is this concept of the offer and the demand. So you have these investors and the market makers, and uh, there is a, a question is how do you actually find what's the best pricing mechanism? Uh, how do you um, optimize this problem of with so many investors? So there are very some, uh, so let me just focus one more thing here. It's very important to understand, and I'll mention in a little bit that um, there, this is a, a not fully connected network. So the market makers are, first of all, not connected between each other and they are not connected to all the investors. And, uh, and so this is a, 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 a complicated network uh, for these multi-agent system, as opposed to uh, what Irina was mentioning and robot soccer in which they could pass the ball to everyone. Um, so there was, this was a fully connected network uh, for the team. Uh, the, here, it's definitely not a fully connected network and we'll talk about this in a second. So, uh, we want to use this system or this type of like uh, agent-based uh, representation to learn market maker behavior. So what pricing st uh, strategy should these market makers have? And literally, these all, these, uh, we approach this as a multi-agent reinforcement learning problem in which we assume that there were multiple types of investor agents that we're not learning. Uh, we were just, uh, we are now doing research in which everybody learns, but at the time they were not learning. And the investor, the investor agents, the, they generate trades according to a given process. So fixed uh, distribution specific to the type of investor agents. So there are multiple types. And so the investor agents have multiple types. And basically it's like, uh, think about robot soccer with a, uh, a midfielder, an attacker, and defender, so have different types, different roles, and basically they are acting according to a fixed distribution specific to this type. But uh, the, the, the market makers, we call them, uh, they have multiple super types, and I just want to explain, and this is the secret of this contribution one way or another, which is representing these um, market makers as parameterized agents. So, uh, they have these agents that are supposed to make decisions and come up with pricing based on the, the how the order books look like and what are the the investor uh, the investor agents they are connected to and so forth. They are parameterized and they have two parameters, basically the risk aversion they have, and we'll talk about this in a second, and the connectivity to investor types. What's the level of connectivity? So because of these two parameters, and this is a lesson for everybody, because of, so if you have a very complex system like this one, uh, we, we, it was uh, the contribution here is because we represent an agent with these two parameters, risk aversion and connectivity. Basically we can have uh, uh, the super types, the different types of agents being samples of the probability distribution over these uh, space of, of, of parameters. So now, instead of thinking, oh, what are these agents going to be? They are really like, uh, uh, they have uh, distributions over these specific risk aversion levels and connectivity. And then we define exactly what are their observations to uh, uh, analyze these as a, 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 a multi-agent uh, reinforcement learning. So we have observations, which are the, the trades executed, that's fine. Uh, buys are positive and sales are negative. We have the exchange prices that uh, uh, are things that it's like observing where the ball is. I mean, it's like uh, you basically are in a world in which you have uh, uh, everybody's acting upon this world and you get to observe where what are trades are executed and what is exchange prices. And then the other actions of these agents are to stream prices to investors and to basically hedge inventory, which means that Hedging inventory means that you actually set, keep 
uh, assets in your portfolio and you do not necessarily uh, uh, exchange them. And the rewards uh, do not uh, encourage this hedge, but think about the agent that may find that the prices are too low, so you don't want to really transact at that time or offer prices. And then eventually these, uh, the option in terms of action is to keep the assets. However, the rewards are positive when you actually end up trading with these investors and negative if you just hedge. And there is a penalty for inventory weighted, for inventory, which is what you hedged, weighted by some risk aversion. So you define carefully these agents after you define the parameters. And then you can see in our paper that the reinforcement learner by playing these actions, pricing these actions, hedging, are able to uh, converge, getting rewards according to what we just introduced, are able to find behaviors by themselves very similar to good behaviors in trading. So basically here, you see that uh, the, the, this is a, the be the, the be the ask uh, pricing, the relation, the, 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 the ratio. And you see these um, price, what we call skewing, which is close to these, um, these diagonal that they adjust their relative pricing uh, depending on their uh, inventory. So, which is this net position. So if you have a lot of stocks, your price eventually the, the ratio is higher. And so you learn to do this skewing and they also learn to manage inventory without paying edging costs. And they are able to, uh, again, uh, be able to, uh, to show that they can learn. The interesting thing here is that we are addressing a very complex problem of, 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 of like uh, learning to uh, really uh, address this issue of pricing and uh, based on some market conditions. And this reinforcement learning can actually learn strategies very efficiently. And we are able to do this realistic simulation and actually calibrate with real data. And there are two fundamental papers here of Nelson Vadori and Sumitra Ganesh and, uh, with, and Sumitra and, uh, and, uh, and Mengda Zhu, uh, basically on calibrating uh, these shared equilibria in general, some partially observable Markov decision games. And that's at NeurIPS last year. And also one at ICAF, the International Conference on AI and Finance last year also. So what I'm saying is that this is to, to, to present to you that the aspect of like this complex multi-agent systems uh, can be handled by through simulations and through reinforcement learning. Okay, so I'm going to move on and basically explain, oh, uh, let me just finish by saying that we've done these in several other, uh, with a uh, different kind of like different types of agents instead of the parameterized risk aversion and connectivity, we did now at the intelligence level like uh, very different types of agents and how they are going, how they learn, and uh, momentum agents and other agents, and we are able to basically by changing the parameters of the agents to generate a lot of data. Uh, that is uh, the way that they actually uh, played in this market. The interesting thing about this is the last statement here, which is what will follow up in the presentation, that we are able to uh, through these. Uh, uh, through these uh, parameter adjustment of these different agents, we are able to generate a lot of synthetic market data, which means that this market data basically never happened, but it is like legal market data and it can be used as representative of the real market data. And that's what we call synthetic data. So uh, this is the power of simulations is phenomenal. So. What, what, so what, I'm, what I told you uh, so far is that, okay, this example of like bringing uh, the concept of uh, classification and prediction based on images to the time series kind of market level, and then this multi-agent learning to try to encompass all these decisions that uh, multi-agent systems, uh, uh, economic systems uh, when trading, uh, actually uh, interact like that. And so, and basically these multi-agent learning, also these simulations, these uh, large simulations to learn 
or to play with the parameters and generate different types of data is very important. I'll just mention now the data and a few examples of the data aspect. And here is the, again, making the, the case for synthetic data. And for several of us, I mean, I'm sure that you face this problem to real data. There is data everywhere. We have a data science uh, as a discipline. We have a statistical analysis. We have machine learning. So everybody's trying to get advantage of the real data. And there are large amounts of, the, of, 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 of real data. However, real data has a, how do you say, as a problem because sometimes uh, it's not possible to access. It's difficult to access because of like um, technical reasons such as size, uh, representation, meaning, how do you resolve all these different representations? So it's not completely easy to use real data. And there is also one thing that I actually want to mention, which is that uh, somehow real data captures reality. That's why it's called real data. But capturing reality doesn't, is not usually, is not always the best thing for a learning system because you cannot explore. So uh, when you are basically uh, just using real data, you repeat what you've seen in the past and you don't uh, get out of that local optimal in which you are. And so you need some mechanism to, uh, to try things beyond reality. So for that, we created this synthetic data that we've in JP Morgan AI research. And we used in particular several approaches for doing these a generation of synthetic data. And one of them is what we just saw, the multi-agent systems-based simulations. And another one is the AI planning simulation, which I'll mention now. And also we have used generative adversarial neural networks like to, that have been successfully used on generating a lot of fake or synthetic data. And so what we've done, and here I'm only going to focus now on the actual generation of the synthetic data through using these planning algorithms is basically like this. We observe a process and we create a model, declarative and explicit, uh, in which we basically uh, explain how does the world change from this state to another state through actions that you can take. As such, as soon as you, uh, reduce the problem of what's happening over time to the state actions problems. We then can basically uh, solve an AI planning system by giving goals and generating like states, uh, initial states, and then we can use a, create a data set. So let me just show you an example of the synthetic, uh, synthetic data. For example, payments. You know, payments are transactions between uh, uh, an account between two accounts, from one account to another account. And uh, we can explain, so imagine the state of the world, you would freeze now, look at how much are the amounts in all the accounts of the world that we uh, actually, uh, that are our customers or not, they have all these accounts. And then how do things change from this to the next time step? And uh, basically you have these, uh, these, uh, entities, accounts, balances, and employers and accounts. And so the world looks like this. Client 45 has accounts 12, merchant 156 has account 24. So you have different types of account holders, uh, clients and uh, employers and landlords and merchants and you name it. And basically they have accounts, they have countries, they have many properties, but they also have amounts, okay? so. If you go from this state, which is all the accounts of the world, to the next state by applying actions, uh, deposit of checks, wire transfers, you name it. And we now uh, uh, specify what actions produce in the changes of the state. And we basically say that the deposit, if some client had uh, some amount in the, their account and, the, the, and they now has a check that is depositing, well, the balance on the account after the deposit needs to be the previous balance plus the amount of the check. So that's it. You define what meant to do, what does it mean to make a check deposit on uh, the state of this world? You just change the balance of that account by the amount in the check. A wire transfer is the same thing. It was in this account and uh, it's going to be transferred for this. In the next state, this account has less that amount and this account has more. So this went down by that, this went up by this. They had like some accounts and so forth. 
So the beautiful thing about these is that when you then do this and you are able to have actions that transform states, then if you, prov if you have a goal, if you have a, a way to generate many of these actions to achieve some goals, then they are actually transactions. They are um, fake transactions. They are syn synthetic data on payments. And now the whole science is about how do you make this but you can understand that because we were so disciplined in terms of defining what are the actions that change the state of the world of amounts in accounts, then you can have synthetic data generation through this AI planning. And now you have all these rows that, that are the synthetic data about payments, which are, they never really existed, but they are exactly the same format by having all these different uh, actions take place. Then we have all these different amounts changing and the state changing and every single of these state changes becomes one row of the synthetic payments data. And we have done these also for uh, other types of data like money laundering and fraud. And we just change the actions and we change other actions. And we have done uh, several examples of the synthetic data. So one thing that will be important is at the end, when I show you like the websites where we have the publications and we have all sorts of research results, you'll see that uh, you can go there to our website and you can see that indeed, we have these particular kind of like synthetic data available to anyone. It's open, you can specify parameters, you can get thousands and thousands of records, of uh, payments, uh, financial bank payments that are synthetic, but very realistic. So uh, I am just going to focus on one other aspect of the data part. So we've seen this synthetic data and the data part that I want to focus on is this work on trying to address the problem of financial data appearing in different formats. Again, now the fact that the data can come uh, semantically representing the same uh, and basically all different here, the rows, uh, here there is a, a metric here outside of these. Here there is January 07, March 19. Here there is like all sorts of like different appearances represented here by row. Here is in columns. And so the question becomes, how are we going to handle all these different uh, financial data to actually use it in machine learning? And uh, Armin and Norbach did this work on trying to uh, assume that everything is an Excel file, that there is numeric data like prices or percentages or growth rates. And there are types of data that basically two types of metadata that is a time period and a, a metric or a hierarchy of metrics. And she basically is able, this Sphinx algorithm is able to look at a table all sorts of like uh, semantics of the table and visual and stylistic cues of the table and is really able to emulate all these cues to convert the data into a standard format. And here very beautifully, you see this particular kind of data being transformed into some data that is uh, very uh, standardized, which any now type of like uh, uh, a financial data, if it appears with uh, in that form under the assumptions that has numerical values and these two types of metadata, it's converted automatically. And here's another example, we don't have time to go in depth, but so this Sphinx algorithm is available as a Python module with uh, the capability to produce JSON and TSV outputs. And uh, it's actually open source. So if you are interested on the Sphinx, the Sphinx algorithm, you can send me email and then we can uh, provide to you the pointer to where it is. And you'll see at the end again, the email reference. But the beautiful concept here is for all of us, no matter what you are doing, uh, you are going to face this nightmare of data in different formats if the data come from different sources. Uh, and therefore, as soon as you have this problem of these different sources, you have to, uh, you are overwhelmed by how to use these data either like for computing uh, some particular computation for some secure for some computation or even for machine learning. So the approach here is this automated transformation of these multiple formats to a standardized version. So that's all my my and my last contribution that I would like to talk about, and then I'll open for questions, is in fact this concept of 
uh, documents being generated automatically. So let me just explain to you, uh, well, I don't want to show this. Let me just explain to you the fact that, uh, oops, these are my robots, that indeed um, there is something about AI that has to do with the fact that uh, uh, you may want to command or to request the AI to do some kind of like a, a transformation. So think about a huge Excel file or a, a huge file of any nature, and you may want to convert it, for example, to a PowerPoint uh, presentation. And you would like to be to have these uh, transformation from uh, one representation to another, driven by language commands, to really occur automatically. And so we did this for AIPPTX. And the science here was about uh, introducing all these primitives, which we call skills, that can uh, produce different types of like uh, uh, representations on the slides and basically now translate requests to those slides. So I'll show you a video of this in action. And this is uh, our document, oops, video. And uh, here I'm going to just uh, move this forward for a second. So here it is an example of this docubot, uh, the bot that generates the documents is DocuBot that says, how can I help you today? And basically uh, the user can say, please run the execution analysis template for the last POV by. And then here it is uh, the uh, by order for company ticker XYZ today. So that language is converted into uh, parameters for that execution template. And literally, and I'm telling you this, these slides were all automatically generated, all automatically generated by uh, that conversion of that language into trans, uh, the, 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 the translating how to use the files in this particular kind of representation. The interesting thing again, is that uh, the user bot, the user can request this DocuBot to perform changes in the, the actual uh, uh, output. So change the color of the figure titles to black on all slides. And the DocuBot says done. And then more commands, center the figure type. And here is very important, this interaction, and it's in the paper well explained, which is the concept that in fact, the, the robot or the DocuBot, the AI system does not know what it needs to do necessarily and so it says, shall I make the change for all the figures or the specific figure? So there is this that the language was not sufficient, like center the figure title was not sufficient for the AI to understand the actions it needed to take. And therefore it interacts in these uh, kind of like uh, asking the user for clarification. And basically the user says, all it knows what it is. And then it modifies the number uh, also does this, and then you can also ask uh, stylistic questions, but also content uh, modifications, modify the number of levels from four to eight, and then basically uh, the, the, and then it also can save this particular kind of like instructions so that the next template would have like the centered figure titles and the color to black, there you go, they're all centered these figure titles and change the car to black for all figures. And uh, basically it's going to add these uh, different types of like uh, levels, uh, change the number of levels from four to eight for this slide and it's done. Finally, and so uh, it can also add more uh, things and it can generate uh, more, more um, uh, and be able to save it. And then you can use things that you have saved. So this is a very beautiful interactive way of handling all sorts of like uh, commands uh, so that uh, instead of saying uh, to a robot, go to Manuela's office here, you actually say, uh, do these slides and uh, save the content. So this is very beautiful. And this is like a AI in which, oops, oops. Uh, sorry. And here I just want to say, so the AI system, you have the user interface, this DocuBot, you have a parser that is able to parsing the language. 
you have the mapping from the actual uh, language to this skill and you have all sorts of knowledge about lines about like all sorts of like template primitives and you generate the document and you are able to also write language on the documents this insight generator and you can really output so in uh, conclusion so there are a variety of other projects that i work on like uh, uh, information discovery all the way to prevention of financial crime as i told you at the beginning so the important thing here is that all these publications are available on jpmorgan.com slash AI and uh, the, or in my CMU website, PILMMV Veloso HTML. And you can send me email at jpmorganchase, jpmchase.com uh, if you want to have access to strings or to other of our uh, contributions. Okay, and with that, I finish my presentation and I'll take questions. Thank you so much, Manuela. That was a great talk. So how can we use DocuBot to create our next presentations? Exactly. I mean, it's a very good question. Uh, you know, my talk was not created by DocuBot, but you know, it's a secret, it's a secret to if you, it's a secret of knowledge representation. If we would be able to represent all these concepts in some representation like an Excel file or some kind of uh, well represented uh, components, then you could write the code to uh, bring like a bulletized list of topics there. So you, if you would represent outlines, they would able, be able to do all uh, many of the things automatically. Very good. So we have a bunch of questions in Slack. I'll uh, read them to you. Talia from uh, Georgia Tech is asking, um, well, she's saying that she really liked the idea of using image-based machine learning. Um, yes. Did you find the image-based prediction more accurate than learning the raw time series data? Where... It's a very good question, and you should go, please, go to our website. There are papers there on this Mondrian contribution. The, the, in fact, the, the classification, the classification uh, of just by no by uh, using the images or using the the input data was more or less the same the difference is that the input data also you need to normalize because don't forget that uh, the values are like for example 100 dollars 122 and 125 for the assets and then there is another asset that has the same shape but it's all in the five dollars 5.2 5.3 and the images are completely oblivious to how much the actual uh the, the, the value is they just capture the actual shape and uh, and that is like an advantage but with normalization you get that also from the numbers one way or another but where the difference was much more striking was on the prediction so the autoencoder based on images and trying to fill in what was missing at this image did much better with the images than actually with uh with uh numbers much better so if you recall these uh uh, in the paper, you'll see that uh, the numbers, like if you've trained on 80 and then there is all this kind of variation after, uh, the, 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 the prediction on based on numbers, it was very poor in terms of like predicting that variation for the like 20 steps. However, the data based on, uh, the, the prediction based on images is very, very strong. Were there any differences in training as well? Were the models smaller or easier no, to they, train? They, the, 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 all this training is a little bit of black art, but uh, it's basically the same training for both. You have to understand something. I, I really want uh, the, you, I mean, uh, to understand something. We did this, yes, on time series data of stock, of the stock market, of stocks, it doesn't matter. But you can think about how much you can now look at any problem any problem you are doing that is complex enough and transform it into an image and use the image instead. We are even like, don't forget that we haven't also do classification of basically what someone is doing, like the activity, the, the daily activity of a person, we can chop reading email, being on a Zoom and so forth and so forth, just by using images of the screen, just by using images. So it's not only the time series data, is the power of using images for many things that we spent all the time thinking about only apples and oranges and cats and dogs and chairs and tables and uh, stop signs and these just for the sake of like uh, classifying objects. And it's not, it's any kind of like visual information 
you can use for training a system, a machine learning uh, a decision making system. So we have a lot of questions and I'll, I'll move on, but just a, a quick follow up on that. I guess the question here is if it's the image itself or the fact that the format is in images or the fact that the domain expert went and found the best representation of that data is what gives no, the no, 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 no. I actually believe it's the images. And I'll tell you something, Irina, and I, I, we all can think about this. What is this power of this neural net and some, some, somehow why is it so good with CNNs, this convolution neural net at classifying images? Somehow that representation, normalized representation of having suppose 30 by 30 pixels and every single value is a number from zero to 255 is very powerful. It's very powerful that you reduce, it's not an image, it's a for, not that you reduce the input to this mathematical adjustment of parameters, computation of laws, derivatives, and whatever, and all the numbers are between zero and 255. There are no, no, there is no other, it's not a bag of words, it's not embedding of like natural language, it's, it's the, the power of having that uniform representation, I think is very big. Okay. Okay. Um, so Reto, is asked, Reto from UBC is asking, to what extent uh, is this not just about overfitting, but over influence? So if you have a market participants that uh, get buy sell signals on similar models, then many of them will buy sell the market at the same time. And this sort of results in a self-fulfilling prediction. I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, now, I'm not sure I understand this. Now, it's not, this is really not the self anything. You basically are, uh, you just want to decide whether you, you are may, talking about herding behavior, like everybody does the same and copying itself. Uh, yeah, here we, uh, we, uh, we are only learning the, I don't know if you mentioned the market makers, if you are learning only the market makers, not the investors, and there is some herding behavior but the, the important thing is that we want to eventually use this particular kind of like simulations and AI algorithms to learn strategy in the presence of very different types of agents. So it's more of a exploratory uh, research and learning in the presence of other agents. Maybe you can send me an email because I'm not sure I understand that, that question very well. Another okay. question? Um so James is asking, in the financial world, it seems that black swan events that cause whole markets to crash are the hardest to predict. Is there AI researching to foreseeing these events? Very good question. No, no. I mean, there is a detection of those events, but the foresee of those events is much harder. So first of all, don't, don't forget that, uh, again, like you say, rare events is not exactly what uh, AI is good at. And uh, maybe this is, this is still research that's going on uh, a lot. Uh, what we want to address, so let me just clarify here. There are many things that AI can't do yet. What matters for all of us is to try to see if we can have AI do the things that it can do. Okay, so the question is not about what it cannot do, is what it can do. I think it's hard to have rare events be predicted Detected is even like hard. I mean, like in the past, if you want to detect some malware, you know, some uh, fraud, if you want, even fraud, fraud is one in millions. So it's a very difficult problem. It's a very kind of finding a, hay, a needle in a haystack. And so those algorithms we do. The actual prediction that is going to be fraud tomorrow, or the actual prediction that it's going to happen like some kind of a spike somewhere or some, it's uh, much harder. The detection is itself. Uh, sufficiently hard, but we can do it uh, currently much better than before using machine learning techniques as a normal detection, but prediction is harder. So James, a very good thesis for you to think about or, or for whatever you are working on. So Joelle is asking, do you interleave news events, CEO decisions, et cetera, along with price movement or our decisions? I need you. I need you coming price. to JP Morgan. I need you joining. Now, we are doing this now, uh, but you know, again, uh, the science is in the details here because we have a detector of all these news and we have uh, uh, an algorithm that can use all these prices 
and uh, or images on what they pass and putting together is more complicated. Uh, using what does it mean uh, these news about like the president of IT was assassinated and how do you feed that literally those news to uh, information that's highly numerical it's not trivial but we are working on it maybe next time like that I talk I will have results on that so it's very good to make me ask so the best way to 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 do this, if you ask me questions about what I have not done, I can just say, no, no, I've not done it. Uh, and, I, uh, and I agree that those questions that you are raising are very important, but uh, I was sharing more what we have done, not what we have not done. So Miki is asking a very relevant question for the systems community. So what are the key performance requirements for machine learning systems used in financial data? For example, are market systems more latency sensitive during inference? Is latency of current solutions sufficient? Well, this is very important, you know. Uh, so let's 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 just try to understand something. The actual financial world, uh, um, in terms of like the markets, uh, executes transactions at microseconds, you know. So. Uh, even nanoseconds. I mean, it's very, very effective at execution. I'm not talking about that level. I'm talking about the level of decision making, like a level of deciding. So, uh, how to uh, how to to price a particular kind of asset. How to uh, be able to decide that eventually uh, we want to buy or not buy. So those decisions, the execution of the decisions is very fast, but the decisions are still within the seconds. And so it's, uh, or in fact, sometimes it's like deciding, like you have a client that approaches JP Morgan, I want to sell a thousand shares from uh, Apple. So you have that and you have to make a decision. Okay, we are going to transact 10 of them now, and then 20, and then wait another day to do the rest. So those type of planning and scheduling is not uh, very time sensitive. Well, it, it's, uh, uh, it's time sensitive, but it's in another order of magnitude. So there's a, but on the other hand, what have matters here is that in fact, in terms of systems, in terms of systems, you have to understand that it's also the, the security of the system, the privacy. It's all about also the, uh, these, doing these very secure computations so that you share this information, but you only share it with the right person and you cannot be sharing it uh, globally and open. It's more about all these secrets than exactly about time. There is timing, of course, too. Yeah, I'm sorry I did not address the systems, systems issues that as much. It's also because I, 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 I probably I don't know them as well. Okay. I'm thinking more about the decision-making level than the execution level. But I can tell you that when we did the robot soccer, when we did the robots, I mean, the systems was fundamental to be very effective. I remember, uh, I don't know, years ago in which we were uh, computing at a very slow, uh, the computation was very slow and we had to really, literally, uh, my student Jim Bruce went all the way to the register level of the machine to have uh, the computation happening much faster so the robots could go to particular place, places without intersecting very fast moving balls without actually uh, suffering from the computation itself. So it plays an enormous role, the systems aspects. Uh, unfortunately, I ha have not uh, come up with a good way of capturing all of those, but there are several examples in which they are needed. Okay. Um, Brad? And from forexes on large US companies. What about on data like volatility indexes or small cap data such as Russell 2000? Very good question. Uh, we actually have um, good results now also on volatility data, uh, but um, stay tuned for the next paper. Yes, we have. We have to change a few things, but we have. So I also talked about other things, not just modern. I know modern is always like the, 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 the thing that people focus more on. 
but I, but I'm glad to get uh, to have gotten also questions about the multi agent simulation and definitely these aspect of synthetic data is very important and these aspect of document uh, generating doc documents automatically is very important too and how they are generated so that's very good so Irina we have um, just two more minutes and uh, I'll take a couple more questions and then I have to finish exactly at 2 30. sounds good um, so Ven Ven is saying, thank you for a wonderful talk. Based on your experience with AI, how far do you think we still are from achieving natural intelligence like human beings beyond artificial intelligence in the financial field? Okay, I have to tell one thing about this question. At the same time, that is very philosophical and hard to predict when. I do think that you need to understand one thing. This financial world or these financial um, functions are whether people like it or not, uh, they can very well be uh, done by machines. I mean, we currently have a lot of humans and we love our uh, financial advisors and we love the person in the branch or we love all of this, but it's really like a lot of computation and a lot of actually just optimization and transaction. And it's, if I would start the bank now, I, or if we would all start the bank now, I think it can be very much automated. The only problem, and here I'm going to tell you this about the, net, the level of intelligence is like this. Unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, this uh, industry is very regulated, okay? So which means that you cannot do this, you cannot do that, you cannot manipulate the market, you cannot, there are many things you cannot do and other things that, uh, and, and well, so, I mean, you cannot uh, just, uh, it's like, for example, if you have a house for sale, you cannot just go and ask whatever you want. And suppose that you ask, so you have this great house and you put it in the market for such low price that all market collapse to be that small price. And so you cannot manipulate by your own actions, bringing everything down or bringing everything up. So it's important to understand that. But I have to tell you one thing though, that it's important to understand, which is um, these regulators, or these regulations, and this is the hard part, usually are not, um, uh, how do you say, uh, operational, uh, it's operationalizable. It's hard to interpret them. And humans are very good at interpreting them. A machine may not understand everything that's written in between lines, and humans do magically. So it's always think about the rules for soccer or the rules for, uh, for chess is not as much, but for soccer like this, you know, you cannot push the foul problem. There are levels of ambiguity that humans handle better than machines do. So I think that even like one day when we'll have much more automation everywhere and much more optimization everywhere, there will always be a level of, 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 of uncertainty and a level of need for uh, eventually uh, invoking human, uh, human interpretation. So, but I do think that the reason why we are not more advanced, I mean, or that, uh, that we have not gone as far is uh, probably because, uh, first of all, it's a very, uh, how can I say, sensitive uh, domain, finances. I mean, you cannot uh, mess up with like how much you have in the bank account. It better be the right amount. Or you cannot mess up with decisions, loan, no loan, or decisions, credit card, no credit card, or uh, so you, it's all very serious in terms of like, uh, it's not a real game, you lose a chess game and then what, or you, no, this is a very, everything needs to be done perfectly and you cannot uh, mess up. And in that sense, then uh, uh, experimentation and uh, uncertainty as, are not as allowed. But I think we are close. I mean, many more things are currently automated. So hopefully we'll do that. I have to go, Irina. Yeah, I think that was a great question to wrap up on. So thank, thank you so you. much for a great Thank talk. you very we much really for having me. Thank you guys all. And I hope you enjoy your research.